Now, this is the bioregional community of practice in the United Kingdom on the 22nd of June, 2021. And we're continuing our series on bioregional economies and welcoming Molly Scott Cato to give us a presentation. And then we'll have a conversation after the presentation. So Molly, do introduce yourself and say something about how you got into bioregioning to start off with. So, yeah, I'm Molly Scott Cato and I'm a professor of green economics at Roehampton University and I was previously a green MP for South West England. So, yeah, I mean... You're a little bit faint, Molly. Can we make you a bit louder, I wonder? Why is that then? Is that better? Yes. Mm. Yeah, thank so you. I'm Molly Scott Cato. I'm Professor of Green Economics and previously I was MEP for, for the southwest of England. So probably what I'm going to say actually comes very much from the southwest, which is obviously an incredibly rich region and uh, also very varied. So where I live in Gloucestershire is kind of like almost the Midlands, but I feel we do have an affinity with what happens in Devon and Somerset and so on. Anyway, I was just going to say at the beginning, Isabel, that we can change the economic system. I don't think we should say we can't. Change. We absolutely can. And not only that, we must. Um, but anyway, that's a, a kind of, you know, so a lot of the work I do, I would say, is at that level. And it's really good to have Jules here because a lot of the work he does is so important there as well. Um, but I noticed that in my list of words, I was being extremely practical. And um, I think how I got into this is that I moved to Stroud and at the same time I was asking the question what is a local economy and so I think the combination of living in a place where people are really very well grounded in place in fact most of the people who live in Stroud obviously there's the greenies but the, the people in different communities it's hard not to be embedded in a place when you live in a small town with such you know, amazing resources around it. Um, but for me, it was sort of slightly theoretical. And I started to really think through what, what it would mean to live entirely from, from the place, you know, from the, the local landscape, really. And so I'm going to share some slides now and sort of talk you through really a tiny part of what I thought about in terms of um, hoping this is going to work. Is, can you see my screen? Oh, yeah, no, I have to say share. There we are. Is that working now? Can people see my slides? Yes. Yes. Thumbs very up. Good. Thank you. I can only see three of you now. Okay, good. So let me just move that down to the bottom so I can see you and the slide. Yeah. So um, anyway, that's just an introductory slide. But I think that does sum up what I was trying to do, which is um, to answer this question, why would you want to live in your local environment when you can have all that delightful plastic stuff you can see in that great mountain there? And uh, so, so it's slightly really, a, it's an attempt to sell people a lifestyle which is, um, a substitute for the, I think, completely crazy consumptive sort of lifestyle that, that is typified by the global economy that we live, we live in. Um, but at the same time, you know, that economy does bring us a lot of instant gratification. So what, what can we offer in return for that instant gratification, which is, in my view, something that we need to evolve beyond if we're going to have a, a future as a species on this planet. Oh, go away. Right, I'm going to try see if I can make this work. There we are. I think that's working. So this is our world famous farmer's market. And there's Dave, who knows 247 different types of apple and is selling apple juice and cider and perry and all sorts. Um, so this is the sort of slogan I use to think about the bioregional economy, that it's about borrowing your resources from the local natural environment. And I think that idea of a circle is very important, sort of not just the circular economy idea, but also the fact that we're all actually on a circle of life and everything. You know, if you if you think back 500 years, everything that people use came from the earth and went back to the earth after they've used it. And how much can we actually replicate that now um, in our own communities? Anyway, that would be the objective. But obviously, it also then relates to your connection with your local place. And um, we like to really argue with this idea of nimbyism, you know, protecting your local place. And in Stroud, we say we're lambies, you know, looking after my backyard. And I think that's really important because if everybody looked after their backyard, then we would have the whole planet, you know, protected. And that's why I'm calling it a globally local proposal. So the objective of the proposal is to achieve the best possible level of well-being for the least possible use of materials and energy. 
And I think it's important to focus on that idea of well-being. And there's actually a bill in the House of Lords at the moment brought by Lord Bird about the well-being economy. And it's this is why I say we can change the economy, because actually these questions about whether we should have a growth focused economy or an economy focused on well-being are actually being raised at the highest levels now. Um, <clears throat> so we need to you know, make it, make ourselves happy really without using loads of stuff and energy. And actually at the moment we're using vast amounts of stuff and energy and we're not happy. So obviously we've got a very badly organized economy. Um, so yeah, and part of the reason for doing this is that climate change is coming uh, or is with us really. We've also got an ecological crisis. We've got a whole mass of crises facing us. And if we don't address these crises by living in a more in a way that's more in tune with nature, then we will have the, the crises will provoke authoritarian responses, by which I mean basically dome societies where we're sort of left outside and the wealthy protect their own lifestyles. And so it's important that we find ways of creating a, a positive vision of the future, because otherwise some rather nasty dystopias are threatening us and focusing the economy on quality rather than quantity. So what would an economic bioregion look like? Well, a bioregional economy would be embedded within its own bioregion. So that's quite important because the most important thing we need to do, as Jules was saying earlier, in order to think our way through to a new economy is to live within these limits. And so starting to live within the limits of your bioregion is a really good place to start there. And I'm not suggesting we all do that immediately, but if you just think about that, then it does focus your mind on what's available locally and how can you adjust your lifestyle. So I had a beautiful mug, which unfortunately my daughter smashed, but somebody actually dug clay here in Stroud and turned it into this mug. And I found that mug incredibly precious because it had never occurred to me before that actually almost everywhere you live, you can find clay, you can turn it into a pot. You know, it's such a different feeling from going to Ikea and buying China, you know, made in China. Um, so I think that sense of connection is really important as well as that sense of limits. So you know about bioregions, they're, they're, it means thinking about how we organize our social and economic systems according to these regions that have defined ecologically rather than either economically or in fact politically, which is how most of our regions are defined, which leads to some kind of crazy anomalous systems. And the idea is that Economic bioregions would be largely self-sufficient in terms of basic resources like water, food, products and services. But obviously I'm not suggesting that you have to go back to the horse and cart and only wear hemp clothes. So a key question for me was, you know, how, how big does an area have to be before it manufactures buses, say, or uh, shoes even? You know, would Stroud make shoes or would we have shoes made in Gloucestershire or in uh, the West Country or whatever? So um, I'm not saying I've got answers to that question, but I think the principle of subsidiarity is a good way to start addressing that question. And that principle, I mean, the political principle of subsidiarity says that you devolve power to the lowest appropriate level. And so this is really saying you devolve production to the lowest appropriate level. So if you can find something locally, then you start there before you look further afield. And again, you know, so this would mean we're going to eat a lot of apples in Stroud and we're going to eat turnips in the winter. Um, rather than going to a supermarket, you know, reading a book, it says, oh, you need tilapia with lime. You go to the supermarket, you buy lime from Brazil, tilapia from Africa, you know, because Jamie Oliver said that was a nice recipe. That's kind of like reversing that thinking, says what, what's growing near me right now? You know, what, what can I use to provision for my needs from what's available? So obviously this works differently with different kinds of products. Um, if we think first about local and non-intensive that would be things like food and house building i mean actually we have pretty good materials in lots of places in this country for for building homes straw building straw bale building or cob building which is very popular in the west country or wooden um wood framed buildings but what we tend to do is you know buy in bricks that are made using vast amounts of energy and somewhere else anyway you can see how that part would work it's more complex um, with the other types of products. So this, these local non-intensive products are a good place to start, I would say. That's why I also put hemp in my list. Somebody is actually now growing hemp and making clothes out of it in this country. So he says, I tried to grow it myself. It's not so easy. 
anyway, enough said, we can talk about that later if you like. But, you know, that's an interesting development that's come actually since since the pandemic. So then you've got, so then people always say, oh God, you know, I wouldn't be able to live without coffee. Well, that's fine. I'm not saying no coffee at all, because obviously that won't grow in Stroud, although somebody has grown a banana here, but it was very small. Um, and so then you go to the global non-intensive and there you have to make sure that you have the system of, you know, fair trade and, and a fair global trading system. So you're not exploiting people somewhere else. Intensive and local, again, that would probably be partly more like your building or your your furniture again I've also gone off and made chairs I'm sure lots of you have gone and made chairs in the woods um, you know that's something where you're actually creating employment for somebody else or, or you know creating your own products um, so it's it's skilled and it's quite intensive but everything you need to make those products is available locally and then you have these questions about more complex products like aeroplanes or cars um, or well, let's say buses, because hopefully most of us won't have cars. And um, then I think you've got to, to raise these questions about minimizing. Th those are obviously the most difficult to get hold of from a bioregional point of view. So you need to have the right to repair. You need to make sure that the components themselves can be reused in different products. Um, you know, end this absurdity of built-in obsolescence. So you have to replace your printer when there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and also end this control over knowledge of how to make those products. And obviously the, the vaccine is a good example of of what that means right now, that drug companies will control knowledge, even though it means thousands and thousands of deaths. So if somebody knows how to make, if somebody can make a wind turbine in your area and they only need the design, then they should be able to make it there rather than having to import it. We import most of us from Sweden and some from Germany. Anyway, so something a little bit um, more cultural about how this would feel now. So again, going back to that idea of why would this be a better life? I think it's important to, to, well, this is what you're all doing already and what I'm doing already, which is really connecting with your local place. And I think the, the French have a very good way of doing this, you know, that this sense of terroir, which is like, you know, the, everything that comes from your local place and really celebrating that. Um, and uh, I'm sure we've all been to, to lots of places in France where they do that. I remember the Agen Prune Festival. They can do absolutely anything with a prune. And it mostly revolves around food, of course, and drink. Um, and obviously apples, as I've already said, is a big thing here. And wh wherever you are, you know, there's something you really value because it's what your local area produces. So we have wassailing here and we visit the apple trees and that kind of thing. And then we have apple pressing at harvest time. Um, so you know, it's just an example of the way in which you are what you eat. I mean, that's obviously true. And it, it's sort of superficially true and also profoundly true, I would say, um, because the content of the vegetables grown where you are depends on the geology where you are. And uh, so although we tend to define bioregions in terms of watersheds, I think geology is also very important. In, in my book, I have a look at the geographical map of the UK, which is completely crazy by international comparisons. You know, there's so much going on. Um, Anyway, you, you are what you eat. You also are where you live in a very important sense. And so it's really making a, making a benefit of those things and focusing on those things as a positive reinforcement of identity and reinforcement of community to counter the sort of novelty of the global production and um, waste system. So I think, yeah, I think I've only got... I think this is um, something that's worth pointing out, although it's also obvious, you know, we aren't as human beings, people that exist in our minds, although we like to think that we are. And um, I think it was Hegel's phrase, wasn't it? The disenchantment of the world. You know, this idea that the economic life we're living is not only destroying the planet, it's also really disconnecting us from our deepest selves and making us very unhappy, um, even at the time we have all this sort of stimulus, you know, fundamentally, we need to connect with nature, we need to connect with each other. And when we don't have those things, there is a sense of disease and um, mental ill health, I would say. So we need to revalue relationships with each other, with other species and with the natural world. And again, I'm sure that's something you're already doing. Um, and then I also like this quote from Wordsworth, where he said, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. I heard a, a guy, I think it was on the lunchtime uh, Radio 4 programme, World at One, isn't it, yesterday, saying, you know, how it was literally disgusting the way everything is about money now, again, talking about the, the vaccinations and it's sort of become normal that you're trained to just think money is the thing, you know, and you should focus your life around getting money. Actually, it's such a tawdry thing. Um, and 
you know, I think obviously as a romantic poet, that that's Wordsworth um, suggestion that getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. But in fact, that's all most of us do in a modern economy. We find a way of getting money. It's not something we particularly value our work very often, but we find a way of getting money and then we, we use that money to, to buy things that give us that kind of very shallow satisfaction and then new dissatisfaction, new earning, new spending. So as I've said, I don't think that's satisfying us as humans, but it's also incredibly destructive in environmental terms. By contrast, Bioregional, bioregionalism generally, and I would say the bioregional economy in particular, requires you to know your place in space and in time, in a sort of circular time and embedded in your local place. And that's why I put in my list of things about find, rediscovering the song lines in your local place, because I think that's, I think that's something we can do, and it would be so precious to do that. And uh, I think if we did that, and if we, you know, found 356 different ways, delicious ways to eat turnips, we would then indeed fall in love with our native soil. And to me, the value of that in terms of spiritual, social and human satisfaction far outweighs the sort of uh, endless amounts of new plastic crap that you're being offered by this economy, which is at the same time incredibly destructive. So that's a little brief overview. hope it gives you an idea of uh, what I think of when I talk about the bioregional economy. Molly, thank you very much. So I'm sure everyone has got questions, but I thought I would just start Molly off in this conversation. So Molly, we've got a, quite a few people here, or some people who are at the beginning of thinking about how to get their bioregions up and started. When we think about what you've laid out there, as the end goal, what what in your opinion are the ways in? How would one start? I think the, the best way to start is through um, community supported agriculture, because that automatically connects you with each other and with a piece of land. And so that's probably how I started here by joining the core group of Strag Community Agriculture. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if maybe it's not farming, it could also be, be fishing, it could be um, certainly um you know it doesn't have to be necessarily vegetable farming but we do all eat vegetables and um it's you can grow vegetables anywhere where anybody on this call lives and it automatically connects you with your local place and probably some of you are growing your vegetables already but i think a community farm is kind of like an economic form of doing that it's not just self-provisioning it's actually um providing a job for somebody and certainly our farm here we we have apprentices and so a lot of new people come through all the time and are trained not just in how to grow the vegetables but in how to work with the community on that so that would be my first suggestion but I think a, a local brewery is is good as well we have a very good local brewery here called Stroud Brewery which isn't isn't a co-op um, it's run as a business but you know the the guy who runs it is very focused on getting as much local produce so he makes sure he gets local barley and local hops and in fact it is all almost entirely now made from local ingredients so that's important and then of course the farmer's market because if you have a farmer's market then people can when they produce food they have a way of, of selling it and so um, you know that's also very important. Um, far more people could eat locally than do uh, and it's it's just largely because and it's actually much pleasanter so our farmer's market is very successful because everybody likes to go there and everybody comes from far afield also because it's just a very pleasant place to be obviously not so much with covid but you know it's um yeah so those are a few suggestions about where to start i don't recommend you start with hemp even though it was really good fun trying to grow it but i tell you what the deer really like eating it so even mm. if you can get it and even if you can get it to grow you know you can't bash it to get anything out of it it's yeah it's quite and all the machines have gone unfortunately but anyway you know that but actually using wood finding things to do with wood is really valuable as well making things from wood local wood is incredibly um satisfying and really gives you a good sense of connection mm. thank you well do dive in with your questions community Molly, you talked about geology um <clears throat> One of the regenerative practices that we're familiar with is the so-called story of place. Uh, so, you know, tracing back uh, 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 bioregions history through time, 
its geology, it, how that has formed its ecology, how water moves through it, but also its history of settlement. Um, and that obviously includes its economic history. I'm curious, have you gone through a similar structured process like that in Stroud? And, and if not, have you any way thought about looking back at the heritage of the economy in Stroud and thought that that could also be a seed of potential for the economy of the future? So um, I didn't talk about um, bioregions here and we don't actually have a bioregional group as such. I, I think that we've got a lot in terms of developing a local economy, but we, we do have a Froom, as you have a Froom in Bristol. Um, and uh, we also, of course, are very close to the seven. And so I would say we're, we're really the seven bioregion and we'd have to pull in Wales as well, which would be quite intriguing actually. Obviously there's a very clearly defined bioregion in the Forest of Dean where they have talked about this. I, I don't know, I don't think they're in your group probably, but there definitely has been discussion about that. Um, anyway, so I would say, I think the thing is about Stroud is they're really practical and also kind of like really like our Tums. So we do tend to focus on food a lot here when you ask what's it about. I mean, I did talk about food. I think a lot of people here would talk about food, actually. So an awful lot of the focus of local activity here is sort of food, drink and, you know, festivals and Kayleys and stuff like that. Um, so I wouldn't say we've been through any kind of conscious process at all, but it is true to say that uh, there's a very strong awareness of the, the history of um, weaving, basically, well, textiles generally in the Five Valleys. And mostly, I would say we're inspired by that because it was non-conformist, radical, you know, like weavers everywhere. They were always radicals and non-conformists. And they were here and they've left a really strong tradition of that, which we do build on. And we are very conscious of that. Um, and we sort of combine that then I would say with the history of artists who came into the valleys after deindustrialization and then um, the greenies who came after them really and that's so I would say that's a narrative we have about how we came to be what we are as a community here in Stroud um, and when we came to, to um, produce our local currency we very much drew on that heritage so we had um, the teasels that you use to raise the nap and uh, the lawnmower was invented here because then after you've raised the nap, you have to go across and cut it with a revolving blade. And that was the same. Somebody in the mill realized that could also work with grass and uh, the Adonis blue butterfly. No, that's not the mill, is it? No, and all the, te the, the cloth drying on tenter hooks. And so, so many of these images from the, the textile past actually were on our, our currency, as well as, of course, Laurie Lee, who isn't from the textile past, but is our, he was on our £10 note. He's obviously local champ. So I would say, yes, that, that was probably where we did most of the, the storytelling and really thinking about our history. I, I'm not, I mean, I don't know anything about geology except I have looked, there's a brilliant map actually, they've got one of the original maps in um, in the Wills building, which um, Richard Pankost showed me when I was there. And it is just astonishing that the variety, it makes me think, you know, you always think, why, why are British people so strange? And I think it's got to be part of the answer. But um, yeah, I just, I can't help feeling that must be crucial. Um, you know, living here on the Cotswold Escarpment, right by the edge of the Severn, you know, it feels um, it feels very much to define who you are once you start thinking about yourself in place. And I would say other, other strategies do think about this, but not as part of a systematic process. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> you can ask me for some turnip recipes if you want. Actually, I, I, I always send them back. <laughs> I give them to my neighbor. I can't bear turnips. <laughs> oh yeah, I have a question. Go on. How important is it um, from an economic perspective when you are establishing a bioregion to actually um, define it from a systems perspective? We've, we've got this sort of an ecological understanding of what a bioregion is and all the systems that support it. Um, but many of us, I suspect, will have bioregions that either culturally or um, ec ecologically or even economically sort of shift their, its boundaries, depending on which lens you're looking through. Um, how important is it for us to be very sure about what those boundaries are before you define what in place actually means? I think I do have a chapter on that in my book, but it's like quite a few years since I wrote it now, so I can't remember exactly, but I, I'm sure I concluded that um, 
you know, drawing lines on a map is not what we're about here. Drawing song lines might be what we're about here, but those would obviously then at the boundary cross over into other people's bioregions, right? Um, but to me, it's it's much more about a sense of identity and a story, a shared story, than it is about particular geographical boundaries. And obviously, the boundaries would change in terms of different goods, as I already explained. Um, and also, depending on whether you were thinking socially or um, economically, you know, in terms of production, whatever, because you know, I can say easily, oh, well, obviously we live in the seven bioregion here and we can include Wales, but that actually wouldn't be an easy thing to do at all. Mm. Uh, certainly historically, that wouldn't have been an easy thing to do. Um, so, yeah, I don't think, I mean, this is just my personal view, but I think, you know, if you think of the salmon people, th that's a cultural designation, isn't it? I would say more, I mean, they can show you more or less where they come from, but defining it precisely isn't really the point. I think the counterexample to this, and I'm sure many people here know more about this than I do, but I think in Australia and New Zealand, they have actually defined their bioregions um, and they use them in terms of government administration, uh, which in that case, I suppose you have to have clear boundaries, but I'm sure like, you know, like I, I'm here in Gloucestershire, am I in the Southwest or in the West Midlands? It's a bit of both really, isn't it? And it doesn't particularly matter, I would say. I feel very strongly in the southwest, but then I'm from Bath, so I probably would anyway. Thank you, Molly. Appreciate it. Claire. Uh, yes, Molly, a, a lot of conversations I find myself in uh, around here about locally produced food ends up with the um, with cost being the sticky sticking point um, in comparison to going to Tesco's uh, or Little or Aldi. And I wonder whether you see how we might resolve that. So again, quite a long time ago, I did some research into farmers markets across the country. And um, it was really interesting because it demonstrated very clearly that that isn't the case, the, the additional cost. And actually, there were, in the end, we divided the farmers markets into three. There were some like ours, which were really quite practical, had a variety of stuff. Some was expensive, some wasn't. Um, then there were some real bijou farmers markets, which were not really practical and where stuff was very expensive but there were also some farmers markets in some really surprising places and a lot of people going to those were quite poor and they one person for example said to me well I'm poor so obviously I have to buy the best quality food I don't want to go to the supermarket and buy things I don't need and throw them away so I think I definitely think it's worth challenging challenging that view um, it's also about like you know, I, I, I'm sure I spend more money because I buy organic food, but I'm absolutely sure that I get much better quality food and I eat less because of that. Um, so it's, I mean, obviously there, there are plenty of people in our society who live on a disgracefully small amount of money and that's something we need to change. We're not going to change that. That's some, why we need to change the economic system. We're not going to change that through creating bioregions, but that's you know, 20% of people or less, and everybody else can certainly afford to buy local food. They might need to make different choices about holidays and so on, but like the, the whole point of what I'm arguing is that you will have a better life if you eat local food and travel around less and don't have such a huge TV. And, so, you know, some people might not agree with me, but I'm sure I'm right. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's just the case I'm making. I had to have long arguments with my daughter about this. Did convince her finally, though. It was quite funny because one of the chapters in the book is called What About My iPod? Because when I started out, iPad didn't exist. And by the time the book was published, it was called What About My iPad, which I thought was really sort of symbolic of the way capitalism constantly sends you this novelty. But she'd also grown up, you know, about five years during that time from going like, you're never going to convince people about that, mum, to sort of, yeah, I think you got a point, actually. So, yeah, maybe, you know, she's with me all the time, so she can't really get away from me, can she, and all my arguments. But um I, I think there's quite a lot of young people who are actually pretty dissatisfied with the way life is. And yeah, obviously it's an argument. Some people are going to say you're just an elitist with plenty of money to burn kind of thing. But there's there's plenty of people who are not elitist and who, who come to our farmer's market. It's it's actually very practical. But the other, the other answer to your question, especially in terms of food, is explaining the economic model of, of the community farm and this is one of the reasons I really like it because basically you've got the piece of land you've got us as the customers and you've got the farmer so there's you know that's that's why it's set up as a co-op because there's no money going out of the system to like shareholders of Tesco and um, if we want cheaper food the farmer doesn't get paid as much so why are we paying more for our food because we think the farmer should be paid decently so it's a 
part of the th the question about the cost of food is about being divorced as a consumer from the producer. If you get cheap food, somebody's being exploited or the money's going out to the shareholders and we need to stop both of those things. And a community supported agriculture scheme automatically stops both of those things. Molly, thank you. We've got a couple of questions in the chat. <clears throat> Dan Scharf is asking what GAST is, G-A-S-T, which is on one of your slides. Oh yeah, what is that called? Global Agreement on Sustainable Trade, it's called. I think that might have been superseded a bit now. Um, there's a whole trade policy that we wrote when I was an MEP um, that's called Green Trade for All. And that's, that's like, I would say, an up, draws on some of that gas thinking, but extends it. So um, it's quite short and to the point. It's worth looking at, I think, for goods that you can't produce locally, um, how you would make sure that yeah, you're not exploiting people on the other side of the world or their environments. Okay, great. And Russell is saying, can you tell us again about the legislation policy under discussion in Parliament that balances growth with well-being? Well, it's 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 called a well-being economy bill, I'm going to say. It's John Bird who set up the big issue. He's sponsoring it. He came out top in the House of Lords uh, poll for private members' bills. And that's the bill he decided to um, to promote. I think Al sent a link to it, didn't you, Al? Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thanks so oh, much. Good. Yeah. Um, because I think, yeah, it's. I mean, the, the issue about the donor and the need to live within planetary limits and so on. It's actually an incredibly complex question. You know, what's mm. how does capitalism drive accumulation? What's the role of the finance system? These are big technical questions. But I think the thing about the well-being economy is it gives everybody a stake in that discussion because it's essentially saying, um, you know, getting bigger isn't the point. Not only is getting bigger not the point, but it's actually not not fulfilling. Um, so growth has stopped anyway, and we're now just desperately trying to recrank the growth engine, which is a, you know, destructive thing to do. So why don't we just think about whether our economy is being successful in a different way, rather than thinking, is it bigger than it was last year? Even if most, even if some people are poorer and everybody's more unhappy, that's still to be celebrated according to this model. Whereas a well-being economy would be, if you saw mental um illness on the level that we're seeing it and the levels of poor mental health that you see in our society that would make you look incredibly that would that would be reflected in very poor economic performance as it should be and so then you would say this government's failing economically because look at all those people you know our habit our environments are in a worse state than they were last year we've used up these resources we've created that much waste we've created this toxic environment people are unhappier more children in poverty you know these would become economic indicators rather than social indicators that you somehow tack on and then you go and ask for money to sort them out and treasury says no you know which is the system we've got now so that's that's the point really of of um a well-being economy it's not just like everybody's better off it's like that is the purpose of that is how you define the success or otherwise of your economic policy rather than oh it's bigger than it was last year which is essentially how the treasury works now hmm. great another question yeah richard well i just wondered how your community farm got started um i have i have mentioned on a there was a zoom call a few months ago with a local farmer I mentioned community supported agriculture because it seems to me a very good model but um he's currently being quite a successful businessman <laughs> so maybe he doesn't feel the need but yeah how does yours did yours get started there were just a group of really fantastic people um innovators really entrepreneurs so one the guy that now runs the brewery also runs that as a business but his his wife was one of the prime movers I think he was involved in the early days as well and Nick Weir who's like a sort of national um, food entrepreneur I would say um, but probably these people are not very interested in in money and they were and also we were very lucky that we found farmers who were, you know, basically our farmer, the original one who's retired now, just loved growing vegetables, you know, and he didn't want to, he didn't want to work on a farm where it was like sitting on a tractor and maybe, you know, organizing for the cows to have their milking machines. It's, there's not very many vegetable farms in this country anyway, which is ridiculous. So he, he just liked vegetables. He liked growing vegetables and he liked the arrangement 
he wasn't wanting to earn a lot of money. Um, you know, I mean, as I said, we paid him well, but he wasn't, he didn't want to be a businessman. That's the thing. Farmers now have to be businessmen and a lot of them actually don't want to be businessmen. And so I think finding at least one, well, probably two farmers who are actually committed to growing food and get pleasure from sharing good food with the local community that is key and the other key is making sure that you have the the pioneers the sort of entrepreneurs on the organization side um, who will set it up and obviously then you need to find some land and our land is this is a, a useful thing about Stroud we have quite a lot of Steiner communities here and we have a Steiner college and so they gave us 23 acres of land just on a hill going up to the Hawkwood college actually that's where the farm started um, and then the, I think the other site was also a, a Steiner site. But I mean, National Trust and people like that have land that actually it's hard for them to let because um, they have very high standards of environmental uh, protection now. And a, a lot of farmers just don't know how to, to meet those standards. So, yeah, you know, you need the farmers, you need the organisers, you need the land. Um, this happened a couple of years before I came to Stroud. But, you know, the, the initial you could still see the marks of the initial period. And we were, were very lucky, I would say, in all three of those. But um, I'm sure if you got in touch with um, SCA here now, they definitely offer advice on how it was done. Because um, it's, it's a movement, you know, people will share their experience, definitely. Mm. Thank you. Thanks. So I've got a thought as well as a question. So one of the things that we're doing at the moment with the Donut for Devon is looking at the domain of income and work and recognizing that in Devon, 80% of our economy is small, medium and micro. And yet it's incredibly hard for those innovative businesses, many of which employ only a handful of people, but are very important as an aggregate in our total economy it's very hard for them to get um, loans and investment for their businesses. So this is a point really where the, the bi-regional economy or the local economy bumps into the, the wider global economy and the reluctance of big banks to lend to small enterprises. And if we're thinking about what would enable that shift to happen so that we can see more green livelihoods, more livelihoods that um, are localized and have meaning and purpose for the people who work there, this is a kind of, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that kind of conversation that happens across that bridge. Well, this is, this is Jules's um, domain, but I will just say initially that one of the things we tried to do when I was responsible for regulating banks was to say um, precisely that, that, you know, um, you will only essentially we we issue we the people through our democratically elected politicians issue bank licenses and what the banks do with those licenses is create financial products that make that massively inflate money in ways that add risk into the system that we then we're then responsible for um instead of serving businesses so banks have completely become disconnected from what is their role in in a society and um that's why we need a that's why we need a, a regional cooperative bank which is what Jules is um, organizing but it's also you know it's also something we need to I you know something I campaign for nationally because mm -hmm. if you look at Germany they have KFW which is like a national development bank which then is required by the government to lend to small businesses um, and you know our our banking system is just abysmal any other country I've compared it with it's so much worse it's almost entirely private it's just focused on circuits of making money it doesn't feel any responsibility to touch the real economy at all and um yeah and that's why you're, you're totally right and that's also why we tried to set up a local currency um so that we could circulate that money and um even though then you know if you wanted to borrow something to bring it into the local economy you, you would probably wouldn't be able to persuade somebody to take your um totness pounds nonetheless uh it does mean that you're cutting yourself out from those destructive money circles as much as you can mm. jules i don't know if you're there and you're listening in if you are we'd love to hear from you i am sorry sorry i had some calls that came in that i couldn't yeah. avoid no worries did you, I was did you... just... 
I was just introducing you because Isabel was saying how difficult it is to build up a local economy when big banks won't lend to, to small businesses and how, in fact, the banking system has no kind of like requirement or moral sense about lending money to, or doing anything to do with the real economy, actually, and why that's kind of yeah, what you're trying to change. Absolutely. So that's why we're, we're, we're setting up um, um, 18 regional banks around the UK, and I, I guess that's that's partly why I've been asked to join this conversation because we do have a regional perspective, albeit that I would very strongly challenge the assumption that we can't change the economy. I, I, I firmly believe that, you know, from, from what I'm hearing, the bioregionalism is, is, is quite a sort of e ecological environmental play. And I'm very much um, in view of the view that we need to both um, you know, look at social and um, environmental issues in, in terms of transforming society. And I think, you know, we can we can try and green our local economy, but that will um, that'll get us no, nowhere if we don't try and change the overarching economy. And we can do, and that's what we're doing with, with the banking system at the, at the moment. So if you go to Germany, the majority of banks in Germany are not those sorts of banks that Molly described. You know, they're not privately owned. They are mission-oriented, sustainable and inclusive banks. Uh, banks and that's the sort of banks we're setting up here in the in the UK trying to um, but we're doing that just as much uh, to to democratize ownership and shift control um, and power away from capital and the state to the citizen and communities as we are for ecological reasons and I think those two two things are, are, are crucial and my interpretation of donor donor economics is very much that, it, that you know we need to be working on both those things um, meeting human needs in democratic participative ways uh, and, and shifting power away from the state and, 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 and capital uh, whilst doing so within the, within the limits of, of the planet, the ecological limits of the planet. And I just struggle a little bit with bioregionalism. Some of the conversations seem very exclusively eco perspective whilst sort of ignoring the need to transform, uh, you know, democratic control uh, of the economy and transform the way things like money uh, and on all sorts of other um, um, ways of operating the economy. Um, uh, so, um, but, but yeah, uh, banking crucial to, 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 to SMEs, startups and so forth. Our sorts of banks will lend, uh, the majority of our assets and our lending will go to the real economy. As, as uh, Molly has said, it's completely the opposite with mainstream banks. The majority of their assets and their lending go to the uh, the casino economy of, of the rich, the, 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 the profits, the rich, whereas our, our balance sheet and our lending will all be oriented to the real economy and to ecological and inclusive uh, development rather than growth. Mm. Jules, Jules, can I, can I ask Jules, would you, would you support us in taking over Wessex water? Ha, good luck. That's owned by some Malaysian billionaires, gazillionaires. Uh, but I'm firmly of a belief that the majority of the means of production need to be in the hands of the people and communities. What are you going to do about it? Well, partly what we're doing is, is you know, we're, we're doing that by setting up these banks, which will be owned and controlled by communities and citizens, um, and, and, and um, you know, thereby helping to reorientate finance towards those sorts of entities. So we hope to be the lender of choice to, to co-ops and community groups and, 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 and so forth. Um, so we're, we're sort of playing our bit in, in, in terms of the, the banking. I think Jules is doing the most important thing in terms of a bioregional economy. I mean, control of assets is really important, but socially motivated finance is absolutely crucial in terms of anything we're trying to achieve. But um, I mean, obviously, it's a it's a sin, what can I say? I was gonna say a tragedy, but it's worse than that, that we have allowed our natural assets to be commodified and sold and profited from. I mean, it's just so infuriating, um, but you know, governments can change that. Governments can, can I mean, there's no question you can, uh, what's that nice word that they have, you know, when people take back control of their national resources, I can't remember now. But anyway, you know, governments can do that with or without compensation. Um, but on a more practical and sort of contemporary note, what's going to happen probably as a result of COVID and as a result of Brexit is that assets will become available um, because 
people are going to go out of business and you know the, the furlough is just unwinding now but um farmers i mean this is a terrible thing but farmers are going to suffer as a result of brexit um in lots of different ways now what might happen with their land is it'll get bought up by the same sort of people that own um wessex water and the banks you know people that don't live anywhere near here and are just doing it so they can gamble on the on the shares or whatever but what could happen is that communities could um could claim those assets themselves and surely our scottish colleagues want to come in and talk about that but you know um reclaiming ownership of land is obviously also crucial to building a, a bioregional economy russell do you want to say something there Oh, many things. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, it, first of all, this has been terrific and it's wonderful to hear from you and from Jules Peck. I think the challenge when you're working at a local level is how you create consequences for politicians who are engaged in pretty corrupt activities with regard to the common good. And, you know, without becoming a bitter person that no one ever wants to talk to. And, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenge on a local level to be vigilant um, without becoming so cynical that you just feel like you can't move forward. We, uh, Isabel and I have talked about this before. In Scotland, water is still a public commodity. Some of it's privately managed, but it is still a public commodity. And we're fighting every day to make sure that it doesn't get sold to somebody. Um, while we're not watching, because that's what Westminster would really like. They would really, you know, Scotland sits on 42% of the potable water in the UK. And, um, but it is still considered a, a public good. And it just, it does take a lot of vigilance and energy. And I think we mustn't ever be complacent about any of this. But on a more positive note, I think there is, because of the clearances and because of those stories that people continue to tell, there is a really strong move it seems to me in Scotland to, to question land ownership and having just been there myself I was um, you know I was uh, looking for places to walk and I was of course in England you need to find a footpath sign don't you um, and I was thinking where are all the footpaths of course you don't need footpaths if you have a right to roam it took me a while for the penny to drop on that and we were trying to find these standing stones me and my daughter and we were sort of trekking around in our car you know off all these tracks no luck no luck eventually we came to the end of a, a long track and uh, we thought oh maybe they're just over the hill there so we got out walking up the hill um, and the, the guy comes out so there's a dog so we were both freaking out that some dog was going to go for us so we're sort of legging it back to the car and the farmer comes out and uh, was just so friendly it was such a contrast to England where you know they may not have a shotgun but you know they've got one in the house and you know it's all get off my land kind of thing but he was like oh I'm terribly sorry about the dog it's in the kennel um, you know you're very welcome to walk if you want sort of thing and uh, asked directions he told us exactly you know just it was a really stunning contrast and I just think you know we should celebrate yeah. we should really celebrate that because I'm sure it's, it's something you have defended that attitude towards land yeah. being for everybody yeah, absolutely. It's time for one last question, maybe two last questions. So I have one about governance. So Molly, at the end of your book, you raise an interesting issue about how a bioregion might be governed. So how common pool assets, common pool resources, might be governed by some form, I don't know if a participatory democracy or some way in which citizens have a say over the governance of those resources. Have you thought more about that since you wrote the book? I, I don't think about this very often now. I may well go back to thinking about it. Um, but yeah, for me, it's sort of like decade old thinking, but I'm still very emotionally committed to it but I must admit I haven't thought it through much more but I can say that there are obviously lots of forms like that and um, it's probably not something I'm going to look at more but obviously Eleanor Ostrom did a lot of work in this area you know social forms mm. of um, management and we we do also have those in Stroud because we have a lot of commons here and um, the way the commons are managed is quite interesting so it's a sort of combination of local people elected councillors local farmers and you know it does begin to feel like some of the systems that she mentions um happen in africa and so on um so yeah i think to me 
<laughs> I think I would favour I would favour very much co community ownership of assets and cooperative ownership of assets. Um, obviously, governance of resources is is a wider issue. Governance of landscapes, and especially mm. when um, resources like water and and so on are um, socially or publicly owned, then um, you do need to have those systems of elected people or you know elected councils or um, or uh, citizens assemblies or some combination of those two. But I think for a lot of the things we're talking about here, the answer is often a co-op and that's certainly true with the community supported agriculture um, and yeah and also with with community assets and somebody asked that question around land and I think it's a, just a very important time to be asking that question I put in the biodynamic land trust there but there's also various organizations that support the you know the purchase of land by community groups whether that's for renewable energy because we haven't talked much about energy have we but that's something else mm -hmm. that in other countries is owned through cooperatives, through local authorities. So when um, electricity is generated from wind, the money comes back to the community. In this country, it's very, you know, almost exclusively privately owned. So, you know, I mean, I talked a lot about the sort of social um, and cultural aspects of bioregionalism, but it's also very important to think about the ownership and governance issues and, we're just not nothing like angry enough in this country about the way everything's mm. been stolen from us. Um, and it's very hard to think about organizing any kind of production, local production system, when you have to pay an enormous amount of rent to somebody. And this is also why a lot of farmers uh, in the Southwest, um, as you know, Isabel, really struggle to, to survive and they will struggle mm. to survive without the, um, without the European payments. Yes, and we are very worried about them falling off a cliff quite soon. Mm. Thank you very much, Molly. That was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to stop the recording.